Um, second talk today is by Alexander Petrov, talking about characteristic classes of Italo. Great, thanks very much for inviting me to speak, and thank you all for being here. So what I'll talk about, it's a joint work with uh, Louis Pan. And so it's motivated by the following, maybe somewhat classical, uh, differential geometric construction. So suppose I have a smooth manifold. And uh, I'm given a complex vector bundle on it. Just in the topological sense. So uh, let's say a frank M. So the data of such a bundle is the same as the data of a homotopy class uh, of a map from E to the classifying space of the topological group GLNC. Three. Three. Thank you. I'll call this map FE. And whenever you have such a map, uh, you can pull back cohomology classes, particularly if you consider cohomology, say, in even degrees with integral coefficients. Uh, you get a natural map back to the cohomology of M. And inside here, at least for uh, I less or equal to M, there's a natural class called the I-Tron class. And it, it gets carried to the I-Tron class of my bundle. This is maybe one way to define these trunk classes. Okay? But now, uh, suppose that it so happened that my vector bundle uh, had a flat connection. So if E has a flat connection, Uh, just in the differential geometric sense, which I'll call nabla. Then uh, it follows from Chern wave theory that um, these Chern classes are, are all torsion. And well, if they're torsion, then if I map them from cohomology with z coefficients, well, it, it means that they vanish in cohomology with q coefficients, and therefore also they vanish in cohomology with complex coefficients. So. Uh, sorry, okay. Well, um, all right, sorry, so maybe the actual statement I'm trying to make is that they vanish in cohomology with complex coefficients. Which is, uh, you're right, maybe my manifold with the many connected components is, right. yeah, technically, yeah. Or maybe in a given degree there's a torsion violence, but that's a good point. All right, so but it, it certainly is true that they vanish in here. But uh, so if you have a class in Z homology with vanishes of equations in C homology, then uh, if you write out the long exact sequence, it means that it comes from some class in previous degree cohomology with coefficients in C mod Z. Right? This is a part of a long exact sequence coming from the short exact sequence Z to C to C mod Z. But actually, uh, you can say more that if you choose a particular connection, then not only the strong class in this complex cohomology uh, uh, is equal to zero on the level of cohomology, but there is actually on the level of co-chains, there is a canonical up to homotopy way of writing this class as a co-boundary. If you represent this as the rump cohomology of your manifold, but well, with C coefficients, and uh, use Chern wave theory. So the upshot is that if you choose a connection, then there's actually a canonical way to lift the strong class to a class in here, which now, well, at least a priori depends on the connection, and I'll call this class ci hat of e nabla. And uh, this is a construction made by Chern and Simons, and th these are called Chern Simons classes of this e nabla. Well, for varying e. Okay. Uh, so now this is a kind of, you know, like a secondary characteristic class, uh, which witnesses the fact that this is uh, zero in rational cohomology. So, um, uh, but now, well, I, I said that you can think of Chern classes as really coming from a single universal class, and the same is true about these secondary classes. So, uh, what does it mean to specify a vector bundle with a flat connection on a manifold? Well, the data of E and Nabla uh, it's equivalent to the data of a local system, uh, which is a representation of the fundamental group of your manifold, which I'll assume is connected, uh, 
to GLNFC. And uh, maybe just to make it very similar to the case of bundles, I can further rephrase this as uh, giving a homotopy class of a map from my manifold M to the classifying space of this group. But now, contrary to the previous case, uh, the topology of, on this group does not matter, right? Because this was just a representation uh, as a homomorphism from this abstract group to this abstract group. So this is the same as the homotopy class of a map to the classifying space of GLNC, but viewed with discrete topology, which I'll um, denote by uh, superscript delta. So it's equivalent of discrete topology. And I'll call this F E Napla. So said so differently, uh, a flat connection produces for you a factorization of this map through the classifying space of uh, the same group, but viewed with discrete topology. And the claim is that, which is somewhat formal now, is that there exists a universal class CI hat living in the analogous odd degree homology uh, of this universal space. Such that uh, for any E, uh, the pullback of this class is this uh, characteristic class of enum. Okay? So in that sense, it's formally analogous to uh, uh, the term classes. But now, well, uh, the upshot is that th this class, it comes from a class in the homology of this classifying space, but which is really just the group cohomology of GLNFC viewed as an abstract group. So topology here is completely irrelevant. Okay. So now before moving to the periodic analog of the story, let me mention a couple of properties of these classes, which will sort of be motivational. And if there are any, are there any questions about the definition? Yeah, uh, what is it? What is well defined? Can I have the back end? How, how did they show it when? So you, you said it sort of both yeah. things. Yeah. But you had to go up and yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I think what I, I think the, the, the only actual mathematical input is term wave theory. That there is a, if you have, well, if you have any connection, then there is a natural way to write it down as, uh, to write your term class as the curvature, uh, well, as characteristic plot traces of the powers of the curvature of the connection. And you have to prove compatibility with topological term class. Okay. Please, sir, can I ask? Please. Does this, does, sorry. Yeah. Does this class ex exist if you replace C with like Q adjoint, like three C continues? Uh, Q adjoint? No, I don't think so. I think we'll soon see that it's really, uh, uh, okay. can take complicated values, yeah. Right, so let me tell you a couple of properties of these classes or rather results about them. And well, since I'm gonna transport something into periodic geometry, then uh, it would be useful to know how this interacts with algebraic geometry to begin with. And so uh, it turns out that if you apply this to smooth projective varieties, you, well, you don't get something very interesting, but, but uh, it's an interesting fact in itself that you get something boring. So it's a theorem of Resnikov that now if instead of, um, arbitrary smooth manifold, you consider the smooth projective variety. And you had still any uh, vector bundle with a flat connection on the underlying topological, on the underlying smooth manifold, then uh, these classes uh, will always be torsion, provided that your degree is at least one, is larger than one. So our old origin uh, for i greater than one. So when i is one, this class which I get in H1, it's essentially the data of the determinant of my local system. Uh, so there is no hope for that to be completely trivial, but it turns out that um, for i larger than one, this is trivial, uh, at least if you go to C mod Q. Right, so in algebraic geometry, you get something uh, which is at least rationally trivial. But it doesn't mean that the classes are universally trivial. And so if you do something uh, non-algebraic, then uh, the classes give you something interesting. And here's another example, which is sort of also be motivational. Um, and I guess it's a little, I think answer Andy's question. Is suppose I have a three manifold, which is hyperbolic. So I'll just mean by this a quotient of the hyperbolic free space by a discrete group, which happens to be compact. 
compact, hyperbolic, three manifold. And now such a thing actually canonically comes with a rank two local system. So its fundamental group is this group gamma, which I quotient by. And by definition, it acts on isometry, by isometries on uh, this H3 and the group of fixed orientation preserving isometries. Um, it's isomorphic to PGL2 of C. So I naturally get a projective rank two representation of my fundamental group. Uh, let me gloss over the fact that it's really projective, that somehow the analog, uh, what I was saying on the middle board has an analog for arbitrary reductive groups. And so all in all, you get a natural class, say in degree two, attached to this local system, which I'll denote row, which now my numerology is that degree two class that lives in H3, sorry, class indexed by two of my manifold with C mod Z coefficients. And now my M was compact, well, it was Riemannian, so uh, orientable three manifold. So by per graduality, this is just C mod Z. So I've constructed some complex number, uh, well, well defined up to adding an integer. And now it turns out that uh, if you take the imaginary part of this number, uh, so this is actually now just a well-defined real number because this ambiguity of adding an integer goes away when I take the imaginary part. So it's some real number attached to this manifold and it turns out that up to a constant, it's the volume of the manifold. Well, I think the way I normalize things, I have to divide by two pi square. So the upshot is that if you naively just apply this in the algebra geometric context, you get something uh, which is rationally trivial, but in some other topological settings, it's really not rationally trivial. And somehow both of these will be motivating examples for what I'll try to say in theoretic geometry. Right? Are there any questions so far? Yeah, so let me actually get to the kind of main topic of what I want to talk about. So let me try to do the same construction theoretically. So suppose I I'll fix a prime number. And uh, let me just try to define things in a, in a lot of generality and then they'll specialize to particular settings. So suppose I have some base scheme, which so far I'll just assume that P is inverted on it. And suppose I'm given, uh, now previously I was working vector bundles with that connection, which was the same as C local systems. Now I'll work with ZP local systems. So suppose that L is a it's all um, ZP local system on X of rank M. So it's uh, the same as the data of a, well, you can take this as a definition. It's the same as a conjugacy class of a homomorphism from the fundamental group of my X. Uh, well, let's say again, maybe it was geometrically connected and I chose a base point uh, to G1 of ZP and the homomorphism has to be continuous. Where this is, these are both profinite groups. All right, and so, so previously we, we, we saw that classes in the cohomology of the abstract group GLN of C gave rise to characteristic classes of vector bundles with connection. And I'll just try to run the analogous construction here. So I claim that when you have such a local system, then this gives you a natural map from continuous cohomology of this profinite group GLN of ZP to the cohomology of your variety. And really, uh, so far I could take as coefficients really anything, but it's most interesting when my coefficients uh, involve the same prime as this prime P. So let me assume that my coefficients are QP. And so from this local system, I get a natural map to uh, its all cohomology of my scheme with QP coefficients. Uh, and I mean, one way of thinking about this is kind of literally as before, so I can pull back cohomology classes from GLN of ZP to the fundamental group, and then there is still a natural map from the continuous cohomology of the fundamental group to the total cohomology of the scheme. And so whenever, if I'm able to, whenever I have a, some class here, I get a kind of functorial characteristic class of local systems. And so maybe just to, since this is really, this map is the main player, let me just give you another way of thinking about it, is that, well, at least if you work with ZP coefficients, um, how can you compute the right-hand side? So this is, computed by the et al cohomology complex with ZP coefficients, say. And I invert the P afterwards, but let me here work integrally. And if I'm given this local system, 
uh, I can form its trivializing cover, which for, for me, just to say in algebraic geometry, will be just a profinite et al scheme over X. So this is a GLN of ZP torsor corresponding to. And I could compute uh, the cohomology of my X in two steps. I could first compute the cohomology of X tilde and then uh, take the continuous cohomology for GLN of ZP. Actually, I'm done. And what this map is doing on level of complexes is that I'm saying that, well, this is some scheme, but in particular, ZP in degree zero maps into its total cohomology as constants. And this map is truly equivalent for any automorphism. So I get a natural map from the continuous cohomology of G1 of ZP with coefficients in ZP with a trivial action. And so if you like the question of studying this map, it's a particular question of how this group acts on this complex. And for instance, in some settings where maybe your X was a Shimura variety and this was an automorphic local system, this is really what people call completed cohomology. So in a sense, I'm asking some particular question about, uh, ac about the action on the completed cohomology. Right? So this is my classifying map on cohomology. Let me denote it by star, because I'll have to use it later. And finally, I'm able to define uh, characteristic classes. So, Well, I said that whenever I have a, a continuous cohomology class of the group of G1 of ZP, I get a universal, I get a factorial theory of characteristic classes. So let's figure out what this continuous cohomology is. So this has a complete answer due to Lazar that if you compute the continuous cohomology of any PID complete group, at least with rational coefficients, um, then well, since I'm working with rational coefficients, it's insensitive to passing to open subgroups, well, a finite index. Uh, so it's not maybe as jarring that this is identified with the cohomology of the Lie algebra of my group. And also, in general, there is still a residual action of the group of G1 of ZP on this cohomology, and which is now a smooth on level of cohomology. And for a general group, I would have to take invariance for this residual smooth action. But uh, in this particular case, this action turns out to be trivial, and so I'm actually just taking the homology of the Lie algebra. And in general, if I have any reductive group in critistic zero, uh, homology of this Lie algebra, it's the same as the drum homology of the group itself as a variety. And so you can compute that this is um, freely generated by several, several generators in odd degrees. So it's an exterior algebra on n generators, which sit in odd degrees, so the degree of Li is two i minus one. Okay, uh, so this is over QP. And so now each of these Li's gives me characteristic classes of local systems. Now let me just introduce notation for them. So I can make the following definition, which is uh, essentially due to George Popus, maybe in, in a some slightly more special setting. Um, but I'm gonna call them Lazar classes. I, I don't know if uh, Popus necessarily endorses that. But so, uh, Lazar class of uh, my local system, oh, oh, let have classes, I should say. Uh, which I would note Li. And so these live in continuous cohomology in all degrees. So these will live in a tall cohomology in the same degrees. Uh, so they just by definition are images of uh, these universal classes under this map which I constructed out of a local system. Okay, so so far everything was somewhat formally analogous to the story of complex numbers, right? Uh, but now, well, nothing from what I told you formally indicates that this is an interesting invariant. Uh, so maybe these classes are always zero. And somehow, if you compare it with the uh, theorem of Resnikov, kind of, it says that here, 
and the algebraic setting, the classes do always seem to be zero, at least rationally, and I'm working with rational coefficients. But maybe just to get oriented with this notion, let me uh, consider an example. So what happens if I study these classes in degree one? So uh, I'm telling you that for any local system, I get a natural class in H1 with coefficients in Kp. Right? So I claim that this is uh, essentially the data of the determinant of your local system. So you had a local system of some rank, um, and if you take its determinant, it's a homomorphism from the fundamental group uh, to Zp cross. And well, homomorphisms from, a, mm, from the fundamental group to a profinite abelian group are the same as first homology of your scheme with, the same with this profinite group as coefficients. And now I'm trying to get a class of coefficients in QP. And I claim that I should just apply the logarithm. So there is a map of profinite groups from multiplicative ZP cross to additive QP. And the claim is that this is the, this class is the logarithm of the determinant. Um, which is just a manifestation of the fact that Lazar class in degree one uh, was, was really just a logarithm of the determinant on this group GLN of ZP. Okay, so in degree one, it does something somewhat transparent. Uh, but again, by analogy with complex numbers, the, the same was happening in degree one, but in higher degrees, at least on smooth projective varieties, the classes were torched. So uh, I haven't yet told you anything non trivial about these higher degree classes. And this will be uh, somehow my main topic today. Are there any questions about the definition of the classes? Can you find right over CP? Yeah, so that I'm a little bit confused about because my understanding, I'm not sure if there is like a very canonical, um, right, so I'm not, since I'm working really with the whole group GLN of ZP rather than like a pro P subgroup, I, I, I don't know if there is a canonical way of making this class lie in ZP cohomology. But I could be wrong. I think it's a, I think it's a good question and it's probably, uh, it's probably better to, to do it this way. For instance, here you see that in the case of the rank one class, the answer is actually yes, because the logarithm turns out to be to land in ZP cohomology, in ZP. Okay. Yeah, but now let me just for simplicity work with rational coefficients and all the actual kind of things we, we can prove about it, they'll be proven via rational P.I.D. coach theory anyway. Um, okay. Uh, this is Alexander. It's from early 90s. Uh, there's probably still more than one, but. It's the same theorem of Fresnikov that Francis Bargiff references in his article on trunk classes. Um, right? So, okay. So now if you're like very skeptical, you might again look at this theorem of Fresnikov and suspect that this was, maybe I defined something boring here. Uh, so, but, uh, here in the, in the differential dramatic case, I saw, we saw that we're getting something interesting if we leave the algebraic category and work with uh, non-algebraic thing, or dimensional manifolds. And I, I'll try to claim that here, these classes become very interesting if you uh, not work with varieties of an algebraic closed field, but really a varieties of, over some arithmetically interesting field. So let me consider the case of a number field. So suppose I'm given a finite extension of Q, And so let's say now my X is going to be a Smith variety. And suppose I have a local system uh, of the same type as before. So uh, for the rest of the day, a local system will always be in a ZP local system. So like, where do you find such gadgets? Really, since it's happening over a number field, uh, these are kind of sparse. And the key example for me, and you really you can assume that my L was of this form for the rest of the talk, you won't lose anything, is that it was a local system of cohomology of a family of varieties. So where, say, F was some smooth proper morphism. Right? So I can run this construction in this local system, and I'll get these classes L, I of L, which live in odd degree it's all cohomology of my scheme X, and now I want to emphasize that by construction, this is really it's all cohomology of a scheme over a non-algebraically closed field. 
uh, and my classes live here because my local system, by my assumption, was defined over X itself over a number here. So uh, maybe a more familiar environment is cohomology over the algebraic closed field. So let's see what happens if I map it there. Right? Well, uh, somehow this would be really analogous to working with singular cohomology over complex numbers. And it turns out that classes do map to zero here for the reason that this map is actually zero. Because when I'm mapping from uh, it all cohomology of, over my field F, I necessarily land in invariance for the Galois group. So where GF is just my notation for the Galois group. But now since my variety was smooth, by weight conjectures, or, well, by weight reasons uh, in cohomology in degrees uh, larger than zero, there are no Galois invariants. So this whole group is actually zero. So we see that at least if I start with a local system defined over a number field and I run this construction, then in geometric cohomology, I don't get anything interesting. Uh, again, in accordance with this analogy with complex numbers. But still, this group is much larger than, than, than these invariants. If you look at the Hochschild satisfactory sequence, the fact that these invariants vanish mean that there is a map to the next term of this Hochschild satisfactory sequence, which is now the first cohomology of the Galois group with coefficients of the geometric et al. cohomology in the previous degree. Uh, and so these classes give me natural classes in Galois cohomology with coefficients in the representation coming from my variety. Um, and uh, I'll try to argue that these classes are not always zero and they seem to be some kind of interesting invariants. Uh, but, and again, maybe this is supported by this analogy with uh, uh, hyperbolic manifolds, because maybe from the point of view of cohomology, if you start, have a variety over some non-closed field, then this really behaves more like uh, a manifold rather than a uh, complex projective manifold. And I should say that George Pappas, he really was emphasizing the analogy between these um, uh, uh, these Lazar classes and Sharon Simon's classes, and specifically these volumes. Right? But how do you actually go about um, computing something? So the only kind of a real method which uh, uh, I'll discuss is using piadic quantum theory. So let me state one particular instance of a computation. So uh, yeah. so here's uh, what can be proven. So. I'll use piadic quartz theory, so I really compute these classes uh, on schemes living over piadic fields. And let me assume that my base field is now just QP. And this is not just for notational simplicity. Somehow, if this was a finite extension of QP, we, we would only be able to prove a weaker statement. And suppose that my X was a smooth and proper variety uh, of, well, again, geometrically connected of dimension M. And suppose I have a local system, and I'll assume that this local system is quartz state. Uh, again, uh, for instance, any local system of geometric origin uh, um, is allowed, and you can you can assume that it was it was like like that. I mean, there's an analog of what I'm going to state for arbitrary local systems, but I think this is kind of a natural level of generality. Then let me restrict attention to these Lazar classes in degree n plus one, where n was my dimension. So it sits in 2n plus first cohomology of my variety, again, considered uh, as, as an absolute scheme. So, so it's really uh, it's a cohomology of a scheme over a non-closed field. And now if we just ponder the whole satisfactory sequence, because this degree is uh, uh, one, so, 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 so my geometric homology already vanishes in this range because I have, I have something smooth proper and dimensional. And so uh, this can be identified with the first homology of the Galois group with coefficients in top uh, to nth cohomology of my variety. Okay, but now by Brancard duality, this is just a Tate twist. And so I'm computing first Galois cohomology of QP of minus n, so the minus nth power over the psychotomic character. And this can be canonically identified with QP itself. For instance, uh, by the Bloch-Cano exponential. And so uh, this ln plus one of L 
it's some p-adic number this way. And the claim is that this p-adic number uh, has the following expression. So let me write a formula and then I'll explain exactly what it means and I'll also kind of remind you of how to think about what state local systems. So the claim is that uh, this is equal, and this is a statement of the theorem, to the following sum. So I should go through all integers. Um, so I have this hot state local system. Attached to it, I have a bundle D hot state of L, uh, which is a graded vector bundle. And I should take the D graded piece, and sorry, I should give myself more space. I should compute its nth churn character. And now since n was my dimension, this is really just a rational number now, because it's a vector bundle when I'm computing its top term character. And I should sum these numbers weighted by the uh, index of this graded piece. And uh, there's also a constant, so I haven't yet quite told you how exactly I normalize Lazar classes, you'll have to trust me that this is my convention, but I'll put an n factorial in front. So the claim is that uh, these a priori p numbers are actually integers, right? I mean, these string classes are rational numbers, but n factorial clears all the denominators. And so this is this kind of weighted sum. And l l let me just remind you what this notation means. Uh, so perhaps here. The homological dimension of the Galois group is H2. Correct, yeah, but... What about H2 of the... Right, but the reason is that... Uh, so, so by t duality, uh, H2 is dual to H0 of the dual twisted by one. And so if you compute H2 of a representation which has non-negative hot state weights, that's always zero. Yeah, for, yeah you're, you're right that a priori there could have been something. Mm -hmm. uh, right, so let me just squeeze in here uh, the explanation of this notation. So if L is a hot state local system, then attached to it, I have a, bundle, vector bundle D hot state of the same rank, which is a graded Higgs bundle. And it's the object which, the kind of object that appeared yesterday in Ben's talk. So Higgs field doesn't matter for this formula, but the graded pieces are important. And uh, again, you won't lose anything if you assume that my local system came from a family of varieties. And so if uh, L was the cohomology, um, in some degree of a family of varieties, then this d-hot state is just a vector bundle of relative Hodge cohomology. So it's the direct sum over all, well, my indexing is d, of r m minus d of uh, relative degree d differential forms, where y is my family. So in this case, this formula, the right-hand side of this formula, it talks about characteristic classes of these Hodge bundles. And maybe a remark is that if I were to just sum up these turn characters without this weight D, um, I would have gotten zero because this would be the total turn character of this bundle. And it's actually coincides with the turn character of some vector bundle of flat connection. And so that rationally would be zero. But this weighting them with degree D is kind of the crucial feature, which will sort of come from a Tate twist and which allows for these classes to often be non-zero. Okay. Uh, so, sorry, please. Define CHN? Uh, say it again? What's the definition of CHN? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I should have said. So, CHN is the churn character. So, if you have um, any coherent sheaf on a scheme, you can define its churn classes and you can define its churn character. And this is just the degree, it's an element of uh, the whole homology ring, and it just takes its degree on part, which lives in H2M. Does it make sense? So in particular, it's a, well, in general, it's, it's, a, it's generated by, but it, it, it lies in the part of the cohomology where uh, cycle class was played. Uh, you, you mean a priori? Uh, oh, 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 you mean, sorry, where are in the symptomic cohomology? Yeah, actually quite the opposite. Because in this degree, symptomic cohomology is zero. Exactly. Yeah, so this is a kind of a interesting feature of the situation, which I don't completely understand. That's exactly right. Um, yeah, so I should say that uh, I'm at least not really sure what to expect uh, of these classes in general, where I don't make this assumption that I'm working in this top degree, 
so let me just raise this as a question, uh, maybe here. Um, so suppose I'm working in larger genealogy. So in general, uh, suppose I have some smooth variety over a periodic field. So let's say it's a finite extension of QP. Maybe this was smooth. Then uh, if I have a, any ZP local system, uh, then I get these classes in absolute total homology of degree. And now, um, well, the uh, PID comparison isomorphism produces for me an actual map from this atomic homology to Durham homology in previous degree. So since I'm not really able to say much uh, about what this class is land, let me not uh, define exactly what this map does. Uh, but I mean, this loss, uh, the fact that I'm losing one degree here comes from the fact that this is secretly first Galo homology of homology of your variety tends to be Durham. And so this map is not quite an isomorphism, but it is an isomorphism of had good reduction. Uh, mod P. So in this case, it's a lossless procedure to map here. And so, well, my classes here map to some drum homology classes. And so, so the output is that I started with a local system and I produced kind of canonical classes in Jerome homology, also in even degrees. And I'm not sure what to expect about them. You can make a simplistic guess that literally the same formula holds in this generality, because uh, at least it makes sense. But it would also be saying that this uh, a priori, just an element of this Cupid actor space happens to be the class of an algebraic cycle. And well, we have some limited evidence for this, but really uh, it could be that this is something more complicated. Uh, so, uh, right, but maybe I, I want to highlight that really there is something slightly non-trivial in that aspect happening in the statement because something which a priori was a periodic number turned out to be an actual rational integer. Um, okay, are there any questions about uh, the statement of the theorem or about the question? Sorry, I didn't formulate the question, but the question is say what the question mark is. So we can kind of, uh, we can prove that it holds basically after projecting onto a summon here, uh, which is spanned by the Tate, by the Tate classes. But so, so, so in general, uh, there, there's a lot of room where, the, where there, there could be a difference between them. I can say like, so after I say how this uh, theorem gets proven, it will kind of be also quite clear uh, what kind of statement we can deduce about these classes. Okay, so let me spend the rest trying to explain what's the idea of this computation. Um, and yeah, sorry, maybe again, before going into this, I should say that uh, again, in, in degree one, it's all kind of understandable. So when I is one, so I get some natural classes in H zero. And if you just follow this computation with a logarithm, it will come out that the question mark in this case is equal to a certain element in zero of the wrong homology, which again, if my variety was geometrically connected, it's just constant k. And so this is the hot state weight of the determinant of the local system. Uh, which is now a character and well, hot state weight, it's locally constant across the variety. So it's a, num it's a well defined constant number. And I mean, this is I feel like a special case for the zero dimensional variety symmetry, right? But in general, yeah, it's unclear what this, what this should be. All right, so let me discuss the idea of the proof. Um, uh, okay. Sorry, I want to keep the complex picture on the board because it will be somewhat motivational. So um, I said that somehow by the, I mean, the, the way I defined these churn Simons classes, uh, they were kind of directly related to usual churn classes, right? There was this connecting homomorphism from odd degree C mod Zico homology to even degree Zico homology. And these churn Simons classes map to just the churn classes. And so uh, let's just try to make an analogy of this relation in this periodic story. And the point is that here, you just have to change the, your notion of a vector bundle. 
And so I'll, I'll use Proital vector bundles, which were introduced by Ben yesterday, and about which he uh, told us a lot. So let me define the notion of churn classes of Proital vector bundles. So, well, so far I was doing everything algebraically, but now it will be more natural to work in the analytic category. So let me still stick to working over a finite extension of QP. And now let me suppose that my X is a rigid analytic variety. I mean, you could define it in a much larger generality, but maybe not so important. And so suppose you have uh, uh, a vector bundle uh, uh, E, which is now a, a rank M vector bundle. On the proital side of X. Uh, so, right, so, um, I mean, as Ben, well, Ben said quite a lot about this yesterday. And so this is uh, a local free sheep of rank N on the proital site. And basically it has just trivializing cover, but this trivializing cover is not an open cover of X, so it might involve some uh, uh, infinite lim limit of a tall covers over X. Uh, but I claim that, uh, first of all, this is a natural thing to consider for the purposes of studying local systems. And again, Ben kind of explained this yesterday. So let me just give you two examples, uh, two classes of examples of these bundles E. So the first example is, you could just stay in the classical category. And so if you have a vector bundle E, which was uh, you just lived on X, and to emphasize this, let me write X analytics. It was locally trivial for an analytics pool, which so kind of a usual classical vector model. Then I can just pull it back to the Proidal site along this morphism of sites new. So, so this site has more covers than this, more objects. Uh, so I can define E to be this pullback. It's going to be a special type of vector bundle, which is locally trivial already, which is trivial already after an analytic cover. So this is maybe not so new, but an example which is not allowed by the classical theory of vector bundles in general is if you start over a ZP local system, uh, the object we're interested in, well, it's our ZP local system. Then you can form bundle which I'll denote as a tensor product of L. Uh, over ZP with the Proital structure sheep. So what I mean by this is that L being a local system, it's trivialized after a profine it is all cover. So um, and I can use this trivialization to compute this. So, so, so I can view L uh, as a uh, sheaf of modules over this sheaf of rings ZP attached to the profine ring ZP. And I can tensor it with the structure sheaf. And so in general, uh, the bundle I'm going to get this way, it will not be of the first class unless my local system was especially simple, maybe like potentially normified, uh, this will not be trivialized by analytic cover, right? So the second class of examples is genuinely uh, uh, new. But I claim that nonetheless, you can define churn classes of these, of these gadgets. So uh, how, before we were thinking about vector bundles as maps to the classifying space, so let me do exactly the same here. So to E, I can attach a map from my X uh, to, which I would note F E again, to the now Proital uh, classifying space of the group GLN. Now this is all happening over K, which I'll just view, say, as a sheaf of groupoids on the Proital site of my, oh, sorry, on the big Proital site of my uh, uh, base field K. And instead of defining carefully what this means, let me jump straight to what this does in the level of cohomology, and there I'll kind of sort of tell you, tells you, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, uh, a complete way of, way of defining this. So my, my ultimate goal is to compute, what, to do something on the law of cohomology. So I claim that there is a pullback uh, let me work with integral coefficients for now to just the Ital cohomology of my variety. And now let me just, if you like, give you an ad hoc definition of what this gadget is. So I'll just define this as a tau cohomology of a certain simplicial rigid analytic variety, which will be the familiar kind of bar construction which you write 
uh, uh, when, you, when you're trying to analyze the classifying uh, space of a group. So uh, it's zero simplices will just be the base field and my field will be non algebraically closed. So it has interesting it's all cohomology. And I want to emphasize this. Uh, then there will be my group GLN viewed really as an analytic variety. Uh, then there will be a square and so on. So really the quantity of defining this map is just the fact that uh, it, it all cohomology of X with profinite coefficients satisfies proital descent. And so whenever I have a uh, proital torsor, I could pass, I could compute the cohomology of X using the check nerve of a trivializing cover of this torsor. And that check nerve would literally map to uh, this simplest object computing uh, cohomology of BGLA. But now, uh, so this is something and as before, let's try to figure out what are actually the values of these groups. And so really here I'm taking the GLN as an analytic variety and my maps from the check nerve I mentioned will really be transition functions for my proital torsor and they'll really be analytic functions. Well, it doesn't even make sense that they're algebraic. But um, by art in comparison, it's all cohomology of all these gadgets, they're actually equal to the algebraic it's all cohomology of the analogous algebraic varieties. So a priori there is a map and really all need a map from the usual without cohomology of the algebraic classifying stack BGLN, again happening over K. And this map happens to be an isomorphism by Artin compared. Right, right, sorry, Huber's Artin compared. Okay, great, roll on. No, uh, you'll see why it's important. <laughs> Uh, but nonetheless, here I have the usual algebraic uh, term class, and I can map it here, and now I can use it to produce Proital, to produce characteristic classes of Proital vector bundles. So uh, let me introduce notation for this. So uh, definition, uh, again, in the previous setup, I have a proital bundle on X. So churn classes, uh, which I would denote CE of E. Uh, are defined as uh, images of these universal classes under this uh, pullback under the classifying. Okay, not so surprisingly. So, okay, what, what kind of invariant is this? So let's try to test this uh, against our examples. But before I do that, are there any questions about the definition? Great. Oh, please ask me further if, if, if questions come up. So uh, examples. Suppose we started with kind of a more boring type of Proital bundles, which was actually an honest analytic vector bundle. Then the claim is that these classes don't do anything interesting. So uh, if E was a vector bundle on analytic topology and I just view it as a proital bundle, then the associated churn classes will just be the usual churn classes of a vector bundle on rigid analytic variety. And this is basically because, um, uh, well, if you just compare the definitions, so somehow this check there, which I was mentioning, it, it already uh, consists of rigid analytic varieties. And it's a trivialization of uh, my original bundle E. So here nothing interesting is happening, but some interesting will start happening if we go into the second class of examples. And let me right now just do one particular example. So suppose that I consider the Tate twist on the Proital side. So I'm working over a non algebraically closed field. And by this, I mean uh, a special case of the uh, second construction where my a local system is just a Tate twist. And well, sorry, I haven't defined it before, but maybe it's better to do it now than never. There's just the uh, rank one local system, which records the action of the Galois group on roots of unity. And well, uh, this by definition for any X, it's pulled back from a point. So let me just assume that my X is a point here. Uh, so then uh, this construction, so it's a rank one bundle. So the only interesting term class is the first one. So it gives me some class in in second, uh, it's all cohomology of this point, 
with coefficients in ZP of one. But again, it's crucially not algebraically closed field. So it's the it's a class in second homology of the Galois group with coefficients in ZP of one. And by Tate duality, this is canonically ZP. Right, the Galois group has cohomological dimension uh, two. And the claim is that this is an interesting non-zero class. And I think under this identification, it's equal to the degree of my theatic field over QP. Okay, so of course, if you run this construction of our algebraically closed field, nothing interesting would come out because it's the group would, would be zero. But it turns out that um, mm, uh, over an algebraically closed field, you get this interesting invariant. And again, kind of to address Vicious remark is that uh, this really does not lie in syntomic homology. In particular, this certainly doesn't come from a usual vector bond. Right? Um, so uh, now having, having done this, let me, uh, in the remaining time, describe the idea of the proof. So the idea is to, so here I kind of told you what happens in a special instance of example two, but you can actually understand completely what happens in example two like how to understand these term classes. So uh, kind of proposition, um, which is essentially due to Annette Uber and uh, Guido Kings. I mean, they weren't, uh, I, th I think at least the way the paper is written, they weren't thinking about it in these terms, but let me just rephrase it in uh, terms which are relevant for me, and I'll say what they were actually thinking about. So the claim is that if you start with any ZP local system on X. Uh, again, maybe X was a regional edict variety. Then if I form the term classes of this associated for all bundle, so uh, there's gonna be an expression for this and well, it's only gonna hold in rational cohomology. Uh, so let me just remind you that this is a class which sits, for me, it will sit now in rational cohomology. And the claim is gonna be a product of two things. It's gonna be a product of this Lazar class, which I care about, which is an element in odd degree mode. And a certain class kappa i, which I'll now define. So it will be just a class in the homology of the Gala group of my base field. And coefficients should better be QP of i for this product to lie here. And I just mean by this that I have a certain Gala homology class and I view it by a pullback as a it all homology class of any variety X living over Q. So here, uh, kappa I, uh, it's a class in H1, so it's represented by an extension. It's a class of uh, extension VI, which for instance can be defined as follows. So I can consider the uh, Fontaine's period ring B Chris. Uh, the plus part, and I can look at the part where Frobenius acts by p to the power i. Uh, sorry, let me actually not squeeze it in here. Yeah. Let me do it properly. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this vi, it's obtained as follows. So, let me take the Chris plus p to the power i invariant. So this is a QP vector space with a Galois action, and it fits into the fundamental um, short exact sequence. So you can map it to beta run plus, and then project onto the quotient by the i term of the Hodge filtration. And it will be surjective, and the kernel will be just QP of i. This economic twist spanned by the i power of the Fontaine's element t. And now I can just pull back this extension along the embedding of QP into beta run plus. So beta run plus was a ring, and uh, was an algebra over QP and QP here, the Galois group X trivially. So I can just push out this extension. So uh, it's a certain extension arising from the adic theory. And so this is my kappa I. And so the claim is that the Schoen classes, they have this expression, right? Uh, so uh, before applying this, let me say uh, what, what kind of statement this is, where it comes from. So, uh, uh, right, you mean the vertical one? Oh yeah, 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 thanks, yeah, yeah, just one. 
So Galo actually here is trivial. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So just a differently, if you identify this with your field K by the bluff cut exponential, that's the image of one under this identification. Okay, so what kind of statement this is? So let me not give you a proof, but let me rather just rephrase the statement. So a remark is that this is essentially equivalent to the proposition. Uh, to computing uh, Soler's regulator on K-theory. Uh, on the K-theory of ZP, in, say, in degree I that's correspond to uh, degree uh, to I minus one, ZP mapping to the first Galois homology of KP of Y. And so, well, this regulator is defined using the I-Strom class. Uh, so, and it really is defined by the, it's basically the pullback along the map from the classifying stack of the group GLMZP viewed as a continuous, just as a profinite group, to the classifying stack of the uh, algebraic group GLM. And this is exactly the kind of statement we're trying to make here, if you think about it in the universal case. Um, and basically it amounts to proving that the Soles regu regulator coincides with the regulator defined using these Lazar classes. This stable cohomology classes always keeps you mapped from K theory to well, that's true, but, but I mean, the map factors through continuous K theory. Uh, sure. I mean, it was clear by kind of by default. I mean, losing, yeah, if I mention G1 of ZP as a continuous group, then it does. Right? So, I mean, just saying this doesn't shed any light on the brief, but I'm at least trying to place this uh, in terms of areas of mathematics. Um, I mean, the key really is knowing that this is non zero. Uh, right. um, so, let me, uh, in the remaining time, using this proposition, uh, explain the idea of this computation. So, uh, all right, maybe I'll finally use the last word. So, uh, the last thing that I wanted from this complex picture was that you really might want to think of this identification as being analogous to the fact that chern simons classes, they map to Chern classes under this connecting homomorphism. And uh, uh, here I'm exactly saying this, the strong classes obtained from bizarre classes by copying with some auxiliary degree one class. So, okay. So let's discuss the proof of the theorem. Uh, over there. So again, I'm saying that I, we don't know uh, how to compute these classes by themselves, but this proposition tells us that uh, at least something about these classes coupled with this auxiliary Galois homology class. And just the, the sole point of the setup of a uh, smooth proper and dimensional variety was to put ourselves in a position where this is good enough to compute the classes themselves. So uh, by tape duality, Uh, it suffices to compute the product of this uh, M, plus first, M plus first Lazar class with the corresponding Galois homology class. Because uh, it's an element of some Galois homology group which is one dimensional and by perfectness of the tape bearing, copying of this class induces an isomorphism onto second homology. That's one special case where this procedure is lossless. Uh, but I mean, we can do this in, in, in general. This is the only place where I'll use this smooth properness assumption. But in general, this computation loses a lot of information about this Lazar class. Okay, so let me apply this identification. It's the M plus first term class of this associated bundle. Uh, and now what did I gain by this? Well, I assumed that my local system was hot state. And uh, what does it mean to be hot state? One way of phrasing this, and you can even take it as maybe somewhat unorthodox definition, is that if you view, look at this Proital bundle, then this has a filtration, uh, an increasing filtration.
uh, which I would note fill sub M, uh, such that its graded pieces are uh, take twists of analytic bundles. So bundles of the form new upper star M, but twisted by a uh, power of this economic character uh, where EM lived on the analytic at offside. And uh, in more classical terms, this will be exactly the graded pieces of my Hodge state bundle. And so my time is up, so let me just say the final sentence that now that I have this filtration, uh, in general, extensions there are really interesting information equivalent to the Higgs field which Ben described yesterday. But we're computing some additive invariant here. And so extensions don't matter. So this is equal to the current class of the associated graded, uh, which is now just a direct sum of GER M of these. This Hodge state bundle uh, viewed as a parietal bundle, but twisted. Uh, but now I claim that this we know how to compute because it's exactly covered by either of these two examples because this is an analytic bundle and this is some power of the chain twist and we know how churn classes behave under tensor products and direct sums. And if you just do the algebra, th this is the answer which comes out. So I'm sorry, I'll stop here. Any questions? How does this class uh, behave when you do repeat extension? Uh, I, I think it's, uh, well, it, it computes with fullbacks. So, so if I base change this to an extension of my number field, the class will just get restricted to the, Gala, the open subgroup and the Gala group. Where's K being QP, uh, where's K equal to QP being used? Yeah, 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 good question. So uh, a priori, uh, Above, I would, this would be, this is always isomorphic to K. Okay, so I'm trying to compute an element of K. But now I'm only able to compute its cup product with a particular class KN plus one. And this leaves, this product, it lives in the second homology of Gala group of, well, K in general, with QP of one coefficients. And that's always just QP, whatever your K is. So this is kind of a projection. I mean, this is an element in K, and this cupping is just taking the trace down to QP. And you can make similar statements about, well, I raised the question, but there was some a strange class in Jerome homology, and, and there was also some projection, copying of this class would induce some projection onto some small quotient of the Jerome homology. But uh, on the nose, we, at least to me, it's very unclear how to compute this. Are those not considered twists by things coming from K? Uh, uh, right, right, so, so uh, yeah, I think Vadim also suggested this idea, but I was a little bit confused because, uh, Well, sorry, if I think if I have a Gala representation, then, uh, I mean, my understanding was that over, over K, really the only interesting class is the C1, because the Gala group of QP of local field only has H2, which is interesting. And this just remembers the Hodge state weight. But maybe I missed something. Uh, uh, maybe there's some clever argument. Yeah. Oh. It'll be very nice. No, thanks. Elements kappa i, yeah. how close are they to being things that generate integrally mod torsion? Uh, integrally mod torsion. Well, sorry, I mean, kappa i doesn't generate the thing even rationally, right? Uh, over Q, for QP, it happens to do that, but, yeah. oh, oh uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know, it would require writing down kind of an integral analog of that, maybe someone just knows of that. Yeah, sorry, it's a question about integral periodic tree. If, if someone knows the answer, please. Yeah. If not, let's thank the speaker. Yeah.